All righty, folks, seeing as it is six o'clock, we will go ahead and get started. So my name is Kyle Packer, and I'm a planner with the town of Oro Valley and the town's project manager reviewing the applicant's proposal for this project. I'll also be facilitating tonight's neighborhood meeting. I want to thank you for joining us for a meeting regarding the proposed mixed-use self-storage development on a vacant property located near the northwest corner of Tangerine Road and La Cunata Drive. <clears throat> I'll start by discussing the purpose and agenda for tonight's meeting. Town staff and the applicant are here to give you, the project's neighbors, an opportunity to share comments and have your questions answered directly regarding the 112,000 square foot self-storage facility, 4,000 of which is retail pictured here. As a reminder, this development requires a conditional use permit. First for tonight, I'll provide information on the public participation process, then give a brief overview of the project. Next, the applicant's representative, Ms. Carrie Sylvan, will provide a more detailed overview of the project. And after Ms. Sylvan's presentation, it will be your turn. Please ask any questions you have for the applicant regarding their project and application. Following your input, I'll provide more information about the next steps for this project, then conclude by sharing more about the upcoming opportunities for public participation. Our goal is to hear from you while ensuring a fair and productive meeting. I'll provide more information about how Zoom works and how to participate when the opportunity for public comment opens. If you're accessing by phone, you may need the passcode 052387 shown at the bottom right here. If you're having any technical issues with Zoom, please contact Malini Sims at 520-229-4836 to seek assistance. Tonight's meeting is scheduled to go no later than 7.30 p.m. This Zoom meeting video and PowerPoint presentation will be posted on this project's webpage as soon as possible. Zoom may take a day or two to process the recording. However, we will post it immediately once we receive it. A summary of comments will also be posted online on the project webpage in a neighborhood meeting summary and forwarded to the Planning and Zoning Commission and Town Council when they consider the application. For all conditional use permit applications, the town requires applicants to reach out to residents before formal applications are submitted, so you can share comments and questions at the beginning of the process. An informational video was posted on January 25th. You can find this video under this project's webpage on ovprojects.com. This is the first neighborhood meeting. After this meeting, the applicant will provide a formal submittal, which staff will review before moving to further neighborhood planning and zoning commission and town council meetings. Please help spread the word about this proposal. If you weren't notified and wish to be in the future, please send a request with your name and address to kpacker at orovalleyaz.gov. The proposed development, shown in blue on this slide, is approximately two acres. It is located near the northwest corner of the West Tangerine and North La Cunata intersection. The project is near Lehman Academy and the post office, as well as single family homes and lots in Miller Ranch, Vistoso Gateway, and Verde Ranch, among others. The graphic on the left shows the zoning for surrounding properties. This property was rezoned from R1144 to Technological Park, or TP, in 2007 and had a master development plan approved in 2010. This original plan focused on the commercial and tech park zone lands from the La Cunada and Tangerine intersection up to Lehman Academy creating a commercial area with opportunities for offices, restaurants, and more. Eight years later, in 2018, the master development plan received its most recent revision to include the single family residences at Miller Ranch. Many uses are permitted or allowed as long as the landowner meets all other requirements of the land zoning. Self-storage is a, a conditional use in tech park zoning and must be approved by town council in addition to meeting all requirements of the land zoning in Oro Valley. In order to be approved by town council, a project must meet several criteria proving it does not negatively impact its surroundings. The use must not be materially detrimental to public health, safety, or welfare. The use must be compatible with surrounding uses and consistent with the goals and policies of the general plan. And lastly, the hours of operation of the proposed use must not adversely impact neighboring properties. Staff have identified key factors for review throughout the design process, namely regarding height and setbacks, architecture, access, and traffic. This site is limited to 34 feet of height, which is what the applicant is proposing. For context, Lehman Academy is about 35 feet tall. Public schools are not subject to zoning standards per state law. 
The setbacks on the western boundary of the project are three horizontal feet of setback for every one vertical foot of building height. As the proposed height is 34 feet, this is currently estimated at a 102 foot setback. Architecture is a key factor in considering conditional use permits to ensure compatibility with surroundings. And the applicant is proposing additional access compared to the most recent master development plan, and the proposed development is approximately 500 feet south of Lehman Academy, which staff will consider closely in the context of traffic. Now, Ms. Carrie Sylvan will describe the project in more detail in her presentation. Ms. Sylvan, when you're ready. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And then um, I know um, Kyle and Malini, you guys are um, maybe unmuting folks. So Brody Glenn is gonna take over partway through the presentation. So okay. he'll, he, um, he'll, I'm gonna continue to use my screen um, for the presentation, but that way you can, you can unmute him. Um, and Perfect, I'll be is. ready to do so. Thank you. Um, so thanks to staff for that explanation. Um, I'm gonna try not to repeat, but I, I will probably repeat just a couple of things as I go through mine. Carrie, just before you start, um, we're having that similar issue as we had with the video where it says you've started screen sharing, but that's all we see. So you may need to reshare it. So what are you, oh, it's saying, okay, hang on. <clears throat> There we go. Oh, of course. Hang on. I just stopped it. Hang on. I apologize, everybody. All right. It looks like it's working now. Okay. Um, I'm Carrie Sylvan with Lazarus and Sylvan, representing the, the developer this evening. Um, with us, as you can see, is Brody Glenn with Centennial American Properties, who's going to speak in a few minutes. Um, I think Michael Saravia may be um, on the call as well. Um, he's been the developer of the entire Miller Ranch um, area from the, from the original zoning, as Mr. Packer um, kind of alluded to. And if we have questions about that, if he's not on, I, I have access to get some answers from him. Um, we are excited about this project. As, um, mm -hmm. as staff indicated, um, the, um, the, the, uh, Conditional use permit is really only the southern area of this of this larger six acre piece, but this is the larger six acre piece that's south of Lehman. So we're at La Cañada, Tangerine. Um, you all know where the where the property is is located. A um, couple of quick notes that I want to I want to highlight. Um, um, as mentioned, this project is part of a larger Miller Ranch project. Um, Lehman Academy to the north, which is part of the Tech Park zoning, um, where it says Miller Ranch Tech Park. That is um, a vacant parcel that will be between Lehman and the proposed self-storage, at least for the, the uh, current. It's not part of this, this conditional use permit request. Um, and then there's the self-storage. And then right at the corner is a retail. Uh, it's zoned uh, for retail. And then the residential that's over on the west side, that was all part of the larger Miller Ranch project that was kind of master planned. Um, the Miller, the tech park zoning, as staff indicated, does permit, sorry, the tech park is the gray area. So this is where Lehman Academy is. Again, this is the four acres that is not part of this, but um, is, is available for development. And then this is the self storage area. The Tech Park uh, zoning, which is two, the um, Tech Park zoning does permit um, employment opportunities, research and development, biotech, um, and other similar in industries. Um, it's mainly meant for business type uses, um, and self storage, as staff said, is permitted with a conditional use permit. The height permitted in Tech Park in the zoning code is 36 feet. However, there is a master site plan that was created for this project that uh, we agreed to limit the height to 34 feet and this self storage is gonna meet that. So the zoning in this area um, already, uh, 
permits the 34 feet, we are meeting that. Um, and the uses that are other than self-storage are predominantly the office type uses, which tend to have traffic uh, circulation that compete with peak times and particularly the Lehman Academy. So we know that once the Lehman Academy was built, one of the issues in the area, which I'm probably not telling any of you who live there anything you don't know, um, traffic has been um, one, of the more, um, one, one of the more significant concerns. And I know the master developer in the town and Lehman have been working to correct and to um, help assist with that traffic issue. One of the reasons we think that taking two acres of this property and dedicating it to a self-storage use, it's a very low traffic user and it does not compete at the peak times. So if this were all developed as office, um, it would have significantly more traffic. So when we think about the context of the area, um, and as Brody will show in a minute, um, their company really does design the self-storage to look like office um, and, and controls the traffic and the, and the loading. Um, staff already did a great job of explaining the, the history of the larger 37.3 acres that was, this was all master planned together, um, and it has come to fruition. Lehman Academy was not the original intended user um, up on the north. It was meant to be all, all the um, office, um, but that's been a great addition to the town when it comes to quality education. Again, traffic being the larger stressor, and we think this helps to develop out this area um, in a way that can, can assist with the traffic congestion um, as to future uses. Um, I think I just want to reiterate we're staying within the height limitations when, when Brody um, explains the overall site. Um, we're we also located this area adjacent to the common area for the new the, the new homes that are being built in this area as opposed to further um, up north where we're adjacent to those homes. And you'll see in a minute, we push the building up against La Cunada. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brody to talk about the company and kind of their approach. And then we'll turn it over to the community for questions. Go ahead, Brody. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Cal. So I'm Brody Glenn with Centennial American Properties. Uh, we're a real estate developer from Greenville, South Carolina. Um, so we're doing self-storage developments throughout the country in secondary markets. Uh, we're doing markets similar to Tucson, Reno, Tucson, uh, Tallahassee, Lexington, Kentucky, Charlottesville, so kind of all over the country. Uh, we are committed to the Tucson market. We've got six sites under contract, or really, I guess four sites under contract, two we've already closed on. Um, and so we will, we're coming into to the Tucson market and we're ready and prepared to be a corporate citizen there. Um, as you can see, this is an elevation of a building we're doing in Reno, Nevada. Uh, and I'll go through and just show some elevations so you can see some examples of buildings that we've done in the past. Um, <clears throat> this is another building we did in Wichita, Kansas. As you can see, as we go from town to town, we change materials. And, and really our goal is to adapt to the community so that we fit into the community. Um, this is another store in Wichita. Um, this store is a little shorter uh, than the other ones that, that we've done. There's a sales center there on, um, on the front corner. And then for this particular building, there's actually residential directly behind us. And what we've done there is <clears throat> to eliminate any, any, any windows so there's nobody viewing back into any backyards and, and so on and so forth. So we work with that neighborhood on this project, just like we're, we're willing and able and, and want to work with the neighborhood on the project here at Oro Valley. This is another project. This is in Valdosta, Georgia. This is a mill town, as you can see, we're changing materials and um, textures and, and window sizes and shapes to try to fit in within the areas that we're developing. So this is the Oro Valley uh, site-specific renderings. Uh, as you can see, we've done some retail uh, on the ground floor. We also have our retail shops here on the corner Probably one of the big things that there are, um, there's several multi-story um, limited access climate control stores there uh, on the northern portion of Tucson, but <clears throat> there's no storage within two to two and a half miles. And our target customer is really a two to two and a half mile radius. When we started developing these 
uh, these stores, one of the big concerns as we went from jurisdiction to jurisdiction uh, and, and with the neighbors is, is the loading and the noise and security. People don't like gates, the jurisdictions don't just because it keeps people, um, it doesn't allow cross access between parcels. And so what we've done is created a vehicular pull through. And so as you can see kind of in the middle of the building there, we've got glass garage doors shown and there's actually a 30 foot uh, vehicular pull through that goes all the way through the building. And off of that pull through is our two elevators. Uh, and so the customer will pull in either with a punch code or on their phone and open the garage door, pull into the building itself, garage door will close behind them, and then they'll do their loading and unloading. Uh, and so that's where 98% of the uh, loading and unloading will take place. There are man doors for fire uh, on each corner. Um, and some people will use those, uh, but people, there's no elevator there. Um, there are only stairs. And so that will really just be for convenience and for life safety. Uh, this is another two dimensional elevation here. Uh, you can see the pull through there. Um, and then also extra space storage is our operator for all of our stores and, and we'll be operating this store. This is elevation from um, the front, I believe, from Oro Valley. Um, <clears throat> and so we can talk about materials and other things. We pick these materials to fit in uh, to the architectural theme, um, but it's certainly something that can be discussed. And here's a site plan. We show an office building to the north of us. We are buying that four acres. We have no plans for that currently. Um, the self storage on the south side is what we're focused on tonight. As Kiri mentioned, um, and Kyle, from the setbacks and the heights, we have uh, made sure to stay within the ordinances. Uh, we also have moved the building um, to the east as far as we can, so we're adjacent to Oro Valley Road, or excuse me, Lacanau. Um, we've also added retail to create some activation there on the corner. Kerry, anything that I missed? Nope, the only thing that I wanted to highlight, there were, I think, some questions ahead of time related to the, the setbacks. And so um, from the, like I said before, we um, we cited the self-storage on that southern um, two, two and a half, uh, two acres. And so it's actually adjacent to the common area for the new home development. Um, on the, the southern edge of the of the development and the setback ranges from property line to the building 100 from 190 feet to 256 feet. Um, so we just wanted to, to point that out if there's any questions. And then I think other than that, yep, we're um, Kyle, I think we're you want me to stop sharing? Yeah, that'd be great. all you. All righty. Well, thank you, Ms. Sylvan and Mr. Glenn. Uh, before we get started with questions, I'd like to explain how to participate. If you'd like to speak, please use the raise your hand function in Zoom. There are going to be two ways to do this. For those of you calling in by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. <clears throat> and for those participating on the Zoom app or website, click on the participants icon. This will open a menu with the option to raise your hand. For an iPad or a tablet, you may need to click the three dots that say more in order to get to the option to raise your hand. Those raised hands are going to be moved to the top of the list in the order in which they're raised. So please make sure that you're not muted on your personal device and that your video is not turned off on your personal device by using the microphone and video icons shown on this slide. If you're going to be, if you have any technical issues with Zoom or have further questions, please feel free to contact Malini Sims at 520. 229-4836 to seek assistance. I'll ask that you keep your input to no longer than three minutes out of fairness to all participants who wish to be heard. And I'll respectfully remind folks of this guideline as needed. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Please bear with me as it may take a moment to unmute folks and move between speakers. I don't actually see any hands raised at the moment. Oh. I do see one. It looks like I'll be starting with Mr. Levi Noss, followed by Elizabeth Klingler. 
again, I'll unmute speakers, but please make sure you're not muted on your ends as well. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thank you, Kyle. And uh, thank you for that presentation there, uh, Carrie and Brody. <clears throat> Look, I'll, I'll just address some of the concerns that we've got as uh, being the neighbors here. Um, my property is actually the, the ranch that's a little bit further off uh, to the, to the uh, west there uh, on 1500 West Tangerine. Uh, so one question I have that uh, I didn't have previously until you did your presentation, and that was the, uh, the setbacks uh, going to the west there. Now you're bringing that over uh, across the riparian property line for the HOA and up against the neighborhood property lines for the individual uh, single family dwelling. So I'm not sure if um, if that was an oversight or if that wasn't um, something that is intended uh, or, or how that is viewed uh, with the city. So just wanted to raise that and uh, maybe get some comments on that uh, here in a little bit. Um, Kyle, I don't know if you want me to just run through all of our questions here and then just wait for a response. Uh, let's go ahead and see if Carrie would like to answer that one so that she doesn't have to kind of keep a running list and hopefully she can address each one as you ask it. Sure. Yeah. And and thank you for the for the question. Um, and I can pull up my screen if we need to, but I don't think I need to. So what we were trying to do is show what what we had we had we had a sense that there were some pre-questions that were asking the question of how close is the building to the closest residential property line. So that is what we were what we were responding to. Um, and and um, I know from a staff perspective, the 102 foot setback, which is what the code requires, which is that three to one, is measured from the building to the property line. So we will be meeting that. So in the area to the north where I indicated we were 195 feet, that was the 102 feet that's required, plus there's 93 feet of that riparian area, which by the way, has, was part of the master plan project and was intended mm -hmm. specifically to be a buffer um, for the area of the tech park to the new residential. Again, it was all kind of master plan. So, and then in the other area to the south, where I indicated that was 256 feet, from building to closest property line across the wash. That includes actually 160 feet of setback from our property line to the building. So that exceeds the 102 um, plus the 96 feet of that riparian wash area. So I apologize I didn't break that down, but I, I think Levi, you can tell me. Understood. Okay. Yep. No, thank you very much. Uh, the the biggest concern um, I think from the your adjacent neighbors is obviously the natural views. Um, so you know there's been comments uh, just with local groups here in the neighborhood about you know is is does it have to be a three story building? I know you guys are going in. Uh, you want to maximize your profits and things like that. Have you thought given any uh, consideration to the the natural views and how you're responding to that to the uh, versus mountains versus a, uh, a square block that the, the residents will be looking at? Yeah, can you, un can you let um, Brody unmute? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, Levi, can you hear me? I can, yes, Brody, thank you. That's so. That's a great. We've we've been through the this same question and concern and and other projects and and we are staying underneath what the required zoning is. But this is kind of the the balance. I mean, obviously we're buying six acres. Uh, we have done protos that are fifty thousand feet or fifty five thousand square feet on two stories, and the building does not get a lot shorter. Um, but it you know from it becomes forty percent larger as far as the floor plate. And so in our experience in the past is that residences have rather have the smaller floor plate than a, than a floor plate that's 55,000 square feet. Um, because if the building's 30 feet, it's probably gonna block the same view as a 34 foot building. Um, that's our experience in, in, in the past. 
And I think, Brody, part of wanting the height, too, because what a lot of people don't want is the external loading, right? And so part of the need to have the height is to create that opportunity to have the loading and the unloading internal to the building, which is why even if you do a two-story instead of a three-story, um, you end up not being able to facilitate that. And that's generally more, um, more important to the neighbors that, that, get, that that's hidden. Um, especially on a site that already um, permits this level of height. So this could be a three-story office building um, as, as part of the underlying zoning. Right, and, and Carrie, that's a good, so the reason, so most of our proto, so this is a shorter proto, most of our protos are taller than this and the first floor is 16 foot clear. And that allows us to get 14 and a half foot openings for the pull through. Um, this particular building will, the first and second floor will be the pull through. So that way we can lower the building. Um, if we were to go to two stories, we'd have to go back to 16 feet. So you got 16 feet and then um, 12 and a half feet. So, I mean, you end up with the buildings that's about 30 feet. And so it just doesn't save you a lot of height there. Um, and so that's, that's the reason for the three-story proto instead of the two. Yep, understood. And your response uh, to other projects was going with a, a smaller floor plate. Um, yeah, I mean, we look, I mean, we, look, I'm from South Carolina. We do stuff all over the country. We we're have we would have this meeting regardless whether it was required by the city. And, and we like input. Uh, we want to do developments that people feel like they had input and in, in are a part of. I, I mean, I'll ask you, I mean, I, I believe that our every other development we've done through a lot of discussions, you know, it, sometimes people said, let's do the bigger floor plate. It always ended up back to let's do the smaller floor plate and have the building a little taller. It's just the way it's kind of settled out every time. And so that's why we showed that proto this time. All right. Well, thank you very much, Levi. I'm going to you, ask Kyle. that uh, I'm going to lower your hand for the time being. You're free to queue up again, but just so other folks can ask their questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and keep moving through the conversations here. Understood. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. All righty. Elizabeth, I will ask you to unmute. And it looks like Maxine will be after you. I am. Ah. There we go. Can you all hear me? Yes, we yes, can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My, of course, I'm concerned about the traffic as well. But my other main concern is the light pollution from those floor to ceiling windows at the two front corners. Well, and even the south, uh, other elevations uh, where they'll be. How how lit up are those going to be? And can you do something to mitigate? I'm. I live on the east side of La Cunada, which seems like we're quite a distance away, but the Lehman School glows directly into our backyard and we've lost a significant amount of our view and then we look at those lights in the stairwells you know and it, it's really surprisingly extraordinarily bright from where we're at as well so I see that you did some mitigation for the people on the west side and I'm hoping you can do something plant trees make the windows smaller keep the lights dim after 10 thanks yeah so so great question and the so there's a there's a balance there that we have to do in the protos and the cities won't want us to use as much glass as we can. Um, as far as the lighting goes, our background, we've done tons of retail development. We will not light this building up like retail. I don't know what the school has as far as light pollution and light um, bleed off the property. Um, our lighting is not as much as retail. We will tone it down as much as we can. Uh, our biggest concern, especially at night, is life safety. Um, and we've got to have lights for that. Uh, but as far as the windows go and whatnot, we can tone that down as much as we can at night, and certainly after hours. Uh, and, and just so everybody knows, our operating times, they, it varies a little bit, but it's 8.30 or 9 to either 5.30 or 6 will be, it will be manned by, by an individual or there's somebody there. Um, and the consumers will be able to operate or come to the facility between 6 and 10-ish um is is the hours of operation thank you brody so kyle then is there something that oro valley can do to make you know allow the windows to be a little smaller while you're doing the conditional use permit 
There'll definitely be something that we consider in regards to the architecture moving forward. Uh, we do have some expectations for design standards that involve pedestrian elements, but uh, beyond that, we'll definitely be taking a look closely at the architecture to make sure it's compatible with similar uses and that includes uh, addresses the needs of the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, even if you plant some trees in front of it or something so that it's not, you know, glowing into our bedroom in the middle of the night, it, it would help. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And Kyle, just to add to that for a minute too, that the town does have an outdoor lighting code. Um, I, I believe, thought. yeah. So, so we'll mm -hmm. um, we'll we will have to comply yeah. with that. And I I believe that I will stand corrected if I'm wrong. That Lehman Academy, as a charter school, um, doesn't have to comply with zoning, which includes the outdoor lighting code. That doesn't mean they haven't. They haven't. I don't know the facts, but I as to whether they have or not, but we will have to comply with the town's outdoor lighting code. So that um, will that will help as well. Yeah, Ms. Sylvan is correct about that. Lehman Academy does not have to conform to the town's lighting code. And at this time, I don't believe they do have full conformance with the lighting. So that will be a key difference between these two projects. Well, that's, that's good to know. I, I just wish that they would be better neighbors. We've asked them to turn the lights down a bit, but oh well. It is what it is. So I appreciate anything you can do. Absolutely, thank you very much. Thank you. Alrighty, it looks like uh, Maxine may have had her question answered. If not, please feel free to raise your hand again. Otherwise, at this time, I'm going to ask Steve Schmidt to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, yes, uh, my name is Steve Schmidt and we live right behind uh, where this monolith is supposed to be built. And, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we are going to lose our view of the mountains, which is one of the reasons why we moved here. I, and if it's, if it's a done deal, which most likely this is gonna, this is gonna happen. Is there any way that you can further protect our privacy by, by planting some large trees? So given the fact that we've lost the view of the mountains, uh, we don't wanna have to look at this three-story building. Uh, is there any way, any consideration to putting a row of trees here so that we don't have to look at it? So yeah, I mean, we can, let me, hey, Kyle, can you go back to the site plan? Yes, absolutely. Or Ms. Sylvan, if you'd like to use yours. Either either way. Okay, or, I'll go back to the one that I've got yeah. here. Does that work? Yeah. Right yeah, here, go, you want? Here, pull yours up because it's the newer site plan that moves the building up. Okay. Okay. Um, here we go again. Hang loose. I'm getting there. <laughs> years ago I wouldn't have known how to do any of this. Hmm. All right. Can you see it? Yep. Yes. So yes, Steve, we'll have we'll have to meet the zone, the landscaping code, but I, I agree with you. I mean the I will say, I mean our building is is a quiet building as far as a quiet neighbor, uh, but separating the uses and putting some additional landscaping is is never a bad thing. And I do think it it doles out kind of the transition from residential into commercial. Um, the question becomes where, where would you put that? I would think on the back, I, I don't know the grades off the top. I mean, I know it runs off, but I don't know exactly how much and what our, what our plan is. I would think on that West side there, kind of the back of the curb, you know, I don't think doing a full hedge, but we could add some additional landscaping back there to try to buffer some of that transition. If, 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 if you oh, think that. Okay, fine. I, I, I would appreciate that consideration. My next okay. question is, you know, you show pictures of your storage facilities that you've built all over the United States, and you talked about projects that you have in the Tucson area. Are any of your projects here um, close to residential areas? Because for, from my perspective, you know, a three-story storage unit should be out in the middle of nowhere, you know, and shouldn't be impacting residents. So I'm curious 
with the with the projects that that are outstanding in other parts of Tucson, do you have the same issue as far as residents are concerned? So yeah, so the so a couple. I mean, there's different sites. Some of them do have residents adjacent adjacent to in Tucson. Some of them are in big commercial areas. Um, in other parts of the country, it's the same way. We've got a number of products that are adjacent to residential. Um, and I'll say storage for, you know, decades has always been a use that is, you know, you see in industrial areas and you see these old Butler building type, type buildings, um, not very attractive. It's not usually close to neighborhoods. Over 10% of America or 10% of households now have storage. And so, you know, having a convenient place to store your stuff is an amenity and attractive to people. Um, the building, while our, our building is three stories, when you compare that to a three story office building or a three story mixed use building, our height is near um, what you'd see in an office building or a mixed use building. Um, most retail developments that you see, you know, they're they're right at 34 feet. So while our building three stories sounds big, um, <clears throat> it's it's not near as high as what you would think for an office building. Okay, well, the, when I look out, you know, the street, um, La Cunada is higher than we, where we are. Are you right. going to excavate? What are you going to excavate so that it's level with La Cunada, or is it going to is it going to come down? Because obviously, you'd be able to minimize the height if you're able to to um, to when when you go west or excuse me, when you go east, that you're able to lower that. So the height, so the so where the final grade is will really be determined on the access points. And so we because we move the building all the way to La Canada. Um, and there's that access point that we're creating to help with the traffic. Um, and I can talk about traffic in a second. We create very little trips as far as traffic goes. Uh, but that will be the driver of where the height of the floor is. I see. I, I see. All okay. right. Well, that makes sense. You, you can't have, and our, it gets a little complicated for us because we've got to have the same height all the way through. And then we've got the pull through that goes through. So we can't, but, but yeah, what will drive it will be that cut that's on the south side. Okay, fine. All right. One last question. This, the four acres that you have, are you, I don't know if you've already purchased them or or if it's in the process, but that four acres, which is supposed to be zoned for scientific, are you going to build, because now you've already set a precedent with the 36, 34, 5, 6 foot building. Are those offices in this scientific uh, 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 acreage here, is that going to also be 36 feet high? So I can go ahead and speak to that briefly. This area is, as the master development plan says for this entire site, that will be limited to a height of 34 feet as well. Yeah, and, and um, if I can add, I, I think um, we don't, Brody, I think I'm speaking for you, we don't know yet what's going in there, but to, to Kyle's point, that whole tech park area, which is the full six acres, is um, is permitted for the 34 feet, and we are staying within the 34. Um, that is a site specific height limitation. That's two feet, right, Kyle, below the tech park zoning that permits 36 feet. So we're res we're respecting that 30 that 34 feet. Um, well, obviously, you know, and I'm I'm a little emotional about this because we would not have moved here if we would have known that this this was going to go in. My question is, did DR Horton, were they aware of this master plan when they were building their homes here? So the, I can't necessarily speak for DR Horton, but I, I think that they, um, that they were. And um, all of the zoning um, on adjacent properties, whenever you buy a, a home or any piece of property anywhere, that's all public record. So, um, um, Yes, and and Mr. Schmidt, I'm seeing. I just pulled up an area. I'm seeing kind of where you are, and I think as this project moves forward, I think Brody will, will be in town frequently, and we can set up a time to to chat and talk about some landscaping 
Absolutely. Um, in that area and too, because you, you Mr. are- Mr. Schmidt, close. I'm going to go ahead and lower your hand now. You feel free to queue up again for more conversation, but I'm going to lower your hand and mute you so that we can get to the next participants. I will say on a final um, point on this matter that uh, to some degree, the home builders were aware in so much as this, the residential homes were a revision to this existing master development plan that had the commercial on site before. Yeah, well, this information definitely wasn't conveyed to us. But all right, thank you for your time. Absolutely. I'm going to ask Lily to unmute at this time. Hi, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I'm Lily. Um, I'm actually one of the parents. Um, uh, from Lehman Academy, probably representing several ones. We actually have a lot of concerns about this building since, um, I mean, we're not against having new businesses coming to Oro Valley, uh, but I think rezoning the area seems a bit much since we already have zones for that, especially like business like close to um, the Oro Valley marketplace would make more sense for a building like that to be adjacent to. Um, my concern about it is more than the kids in Lehman, they don't really have transportation. It's either they have, a, their parents pick them up or they walk or have bikes around. And even though you guys keep saying that this is a low traffic area, it seems like you guys have like specific areas for cars to come in and out and having a lot of kids walking it's, it's a very big concern, having them walking and having bikes around, uh, especially with the traffic that it already exists, it's a big concern. So again, I'm not against having a company come to Oro Valley. I think it's a good idea, that's okay. And I do agree that also the value of the houses that are around there will be dropping because of this. It will pretty much uh, pollute in some ways the views, like they said before, and um, I don't think it's a good idea to have it so close to the school, including like if you know, we don't know what people are storing in those places. Um, so I don't know. It's it's a big concern for for the children around that area. So I was just wondering if this is actually a done deal, or are you actually asking if if it should be uh, actual if the zoning should be changed or if it's something that you guys already are already agree and just hearing the concerns that people have. So I can speak a little bit to the process, Lily. This is uh, not necessarily, this is not a rezoning. This is uh, a conditional use within zoning. So what's going to be happening is uh, we'll be forwarding a summary of this neighborhood meeting to the Planning and Zoning Commission, who will make a recommendation based on some of the criteria I shared earlier and that you can find in the informational video regarding this as a conditional use. And so when the Planning and Zoning Commission makes a recommendation, it'll be brought to town council who will then approve or deny this as a request. This is um, not a done deal at this point. This entire project is contingent on town council approval. And if I can um, if I can respond to a couple of the things, and Brody, you may want to respond to the security question, because um, I know that comes up a lot. This is the this is the current zoning that is permitted um, on the on the site. So um, the Lehman Academy was the entity that kind of came in and wasn't expected um, necessarily as part of this zoning. So everything sort of where Lehman is, and I'll show you where this works with Lehman because this is important. So here's Lehman. Everything else in this six acres is zoned for, um, for tech park office, which has normal office hours, um, which really does add traffic during the peak morning and the peak afternoon, which is our times where Lehman Academy, also the, the students and and Lily, to your point, as a as a parent, um, you know you're doing a lot of the the drop off and the pickup. 
So as we talk about um, the potential for taking two of the acres and pulling it out of an office use, which is a high conf conflicting um, traffic use, and replacing it with a, a lower traffic self-storage, we do, we do feel like that actually is more complementary to the school and the traffic situation um, that's out there. This zoning has been in place for, um, I can't remember, Kyle, what you said, but well over 10 years, um, which included the, the home zoning. Again, it was part of the full 32, 36 acre um, zoning. So the, um, Kyle went through the process and that's really, really important, but also understanding what the underlying zoning permits um, is also important as we talk about maybe a conditional use permit for, for this use. Brody, did you want to talk about the um, safety? Let me see, I should unmute him. That would probably help him if you'd like to. Yeah, so thank you. So Lily, so all great questions. I've got four children um, that are in school age and I do carpool and understand. I will say it, in reality, from a traffic standpoint, we create very, very few trips, especially AM uh, peak, which would be when you're dropping your kids off. Um, and PM peak would create 15 trips, uh, which is really seven people uh, PM, which is five o'clock. So from a traffic standpoint, we're a fraction of what an office would be. Um, and so there's not as big a conflict there um, as you would have with retail or office. As far as security goes, as I mentioned, all of our loading, 98% of our loading or unloading is done within the building. We have cameras throughout the building. Extra space storage, in our opinion, is absolute best in class operator in the country. They're the second largest um, operator in the country as well, self-storage operator, um, and they monitor the cameras 24 hours a day. Lily, does that help answer some of your questions? Um, yes, it does. I was just wondering as well, like, is, are they going to have one entrance? Is it going to be on the Tangerine side or is it going to be Kenyatta and Tangerine side, both openings coming traffic? to like to park and enter the building. Mm -hmm. So the, our access point is off of La Canada. There is access through the development. If you look at the master plan that was designed for to have cross access between all the parcels that go down to Tangerine. Uh, but I would say that the majority of our traffic will come off of La Canada. And just to show you Really, so again, this is kind of the, the master plan. So um, there, what we're showing right now is that there's probably gonna be another entrance off of La Cunada here so that we are not conflicting with Lehman and we'll be working with the town to establish that. I don't know if it's gonna be right here, but somewhere along here. And then the idea is that this area with the tech park zoning and the commercial that's already zoned and, and planned at the corner, there is an access off of tangerine and that will all be that will all be shared. Um, but as Brody said, we're expecting most of our traffic to come in off of La Pinata and obviously it won't come through to tangerine until that's built. Um, and we're not we're not in control of that. Alrighty. Lily, I'm going to go ahead and lower your hand at this time. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to raise it again. At this time I'm going to unmute uh, Hugh, and it looks like Jerry will be after Hugh. Hello, can you hear me? Hello there, Hugh. Hi, I, I, uh, I'm, a lot of my questions have already been answered with the previous uh, people speaking, but I, my focus is, has been the traffic issue. I, I know that, that you probably, uh, your main access will be off of La Cunada. But I know that right now there is no left turn into that area off of La Cunada, so that everybody that would want access to that point would have to go, if they were going northbound on La Cunada, and most will, uh, they'd have to make a U-turn up at Placida del Cobo, which turns onto Sunkiss there. And that will be a huge traffic challenge if, if that's your intended ingress and e main ingress and egress, if that's the point. That's the first part. The second part 
uh, was, uh, I think Brody mentioned it, is that there's free movement of vehicles like there is in most of these types of developments, uh, north and south there, would, would traffic from this area be actually um, allowed to go through the school area and exit onto uh, Sunkist? That would be, a, I think, a significant increase during the peak times uh, for traffic. And I'm concerned about the traffic issues here. Yes, so I can help answer some of those. And I, I wasn't sure is, um, I see David Laws, would you rather answer that, David? Yeah, I'll ask David Laws to unmute here. All right, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My video. There we go. So a couple of things. Number one, as part of this project, we'll be evaluating a traffic report. At this preliminary stage, we've not seen that. So the master development already has a report that was approved years ago. Um, that's been evaluated multiple times with Lehman Academy. Uh, the town engineers work very closely with the school to make sure that traffic is working as best as it can. With this project, we'll be looking at that traffic situation again. And as Carrie mentioned, uh, that would include opening up a new median opening through La Cunada for access into this parcel. So um, yeah. we would want to try to keep that school traffic separate from you know, this type of traffic as much as we can. So we're gonna definitely be looking to do that. And that traffic report is gonna be an important part of uh, that evaluation. Does the traffic report include the traffic from the development on the south of Lehman Academy that might be going through the Lehman Academy parking lot? Again, when we look at that, we'll be, take, we'll be taking a look to see how, how can we limit that you know, cross-contamination between traffic. When you know, school is in, in session, parents are picking up kids, we don't wanna see that commercial traffic intermingling with, with you know, school pickup. So we're gonna look at different ways to try to minimize those impacts as much as we can. I, beyond that, without having a formal submittal uh, and a traffic report, it's hard to say. When, when would that become available, or is that in a future public meeting? That traffic report comes in with a formal application. So at this stage, we're just at a pre-application stage. At some point, we'll, assuming this project moves forward, we'll get a formal submittal, which will include a traffic report that staff will review. Will Subsequent to that, will there be a public meeting like this where we can, where those of us that are affected can, can comment on that? Sure, I mean, it's the same process that, that happened with some of these other projects. So Miller Ranch, the residential piece uh, to the West, you know, when that project went through, there was a traffic report associated with that. The impacts to Sunkiss, the connection of Sunkiss, you know, each of these projects and developments as those happen, you know, the traffic element is a very important part of that. So it'll be part of that formal application at some point in the future. Again, my question was, is there a point subsequent to that report when those of us affected have an opportunity to comment on it? Sure, Kyle, do you want to talk about process in terms of next steps? Yeah, absolutely. So once staff has reviewed this, uh, we will bring uh, a staff report as well as uh, the plans to uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission, where applicants or rather uh, residents will be able to provide their comments again in a situation similar to this. And it will be posted online on OV projects. So documents, as we receive them, as we receive the applicant submittal, it will be shared uh, on ovprojects.com. It's gonna be the best place to gather information on this project. And at the end of this presentation, I'll have a link to where you can gather that information as well as the project's uh, reference name on that website. One final thing, uh, is there some process or method that, that you use to notify those of us affected? Can we get on some kind of a mailing list or something like that? Yes, absolutely. Please, if you'd like to be on a mailing list for this project, reach out to me at kpacker at orovalleyaz.gov. You'll see that uh, email address here in a few slides, but that is my email address. And if you send your address and uh, first name or you know name there, I'll be able to take you down and get you on the formal notification list. We send out postcards for each public meeting that we have, as well as neighborhood meeting, and you'll be kept abreast of this project. Thank you very much. Absolutely. 
At this time, I'm going to ask Jerry to unmute, and it looks like Lily will be on deck after that. Good evening. Good evening, um, Jerry. I have a, a, you know some follow on from. Okay, the topic is traffic, and it's a follow on to what um, uh, Hugh was talking about, and um, the overall traffic as it exists today is. Uh, is very poor. And we have uh, put up, <clears throat> or the city has, uh, no U-turn over by Placida El Como. <clears throat> uh, it still is a problem. People are still doing uh, U-turns. The speed limit coming into a school area has not been reduced. And we're gonna add more traffic as well as the original plan had with uh, Miller Ranch had an exit from down towards uh, Tangerine. The school was supposed to have just a uh, emergency exit exiting out onto Sunkits. Now, uh, my concern is exactly what Hugh brought up. You know, as David said, when we get to a certain place, there's going to be a traffic report and plan, things changed. And as they change, there does not appear to have been public, um, I'll say dissemination of that information. It is very, during the peak hours with the school, it is very poor traffic flow there. And um, so what, what my concern is, is that the traffic plan and report that it, does become public, and it does become uh, a point that the that it could be discussed. The other item would that I have uh, related to that would be: Would a traffic flow pattern going down through the uh, acreage south of this proposed site uh, can that be developed? so that that exit and entrance could be uh, tied together um, earlier. And if, if, and if it can, can they, is it also being planned up north towards Lehman for Lehman to be opened up that it will have access to that, we'll call it a road or access way down to Tangerine. That's my uh, concern. Go ahead, Kyle. Oh, uh, I believe um, it sounds like there were two questions in there. Um, Carrie, if you'd like to take whichever you were hoping to answer or. Um, okay, I'm going to share this really quickly. So, um, I mean, the first the first question that I heard was, is the traffic impact analysis going to be public? And the answer is yes. Um, it is going to be public. Um, I think Kyle already said it'll be posted when we submit it. Um, and we are um, analyzing I, I, um, the, the site and the current conditions, Jerry, which, which, anti which then means the changed conditions. Because you're right, the school wasn't anticipated when this was originally master planned. Um, and so the town has worked very closely, not only with Lehman, but with the um, Mr. Sarabia is on the on the line, but the, the sort of master developer of the full 36 acres as it was master planned. Um, so um, on, on trying to create some safer conditions. Um, the, the original master plan that was approved did exactly what you were talking about, which was talk, accommodated sort of that cross traffic and making sure that that was, that was analyzed. So we're gonna be updating that in the, in the traffic impact analysis. The ultimate goal as we've worked, and I was a part of that with the town staff, David Laws and the town engineer, is to really do what we can to maintain um, some level of cross connection, but really separation between the school traffic and the um, traffic for the tech park and the commercial area, but allow this area to function with, with cross access and cross traffic to help distribute. Um, so. I, David hasn't raised his hand, which means I didn't screw anything up when I just explained that. Um, 
And Kyle, you can tell me if I got both questions because I'm not entirely sure. I, I believe I believe that. Does that address your questions, Jerry? Uh, yes, it does. And I would hope that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as the traffic report is evaluated, it's just not for the technology uh, park, you know, the, the self-storage, but it's really overall because Lehman, um, it, because this is just going to add to the issues with Lehman on Sunkiss and also uh, the La, La, um, La Cunada, as well as the uh, potential that is there, as the, uh, the, I believe it was Lily was pointing out and representing the school um, or some of the school families. The, the speed limit and coming around that bend, uh, there's, there's a potential safety issues that it would be nice that the uh, city does address in the overall traffic plan. Thank you. And D David does have uh, some words to say, I believe. Yeah, I was just going to mention that the traffic report does not just only look at the self storage facility when that comes in. It will look at all the adjacent uh, uses in addition to the traffic that's already on La Cunada and Tangerine. So it takes a much bigger picture um, beyond just the boundary of, of the site for the self storage okay, facility. So um, that will definitely be a part of that report. Okay. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. All righty. I'm going to mute you and lower your hand. And it looks like I will be unmuting Lily at this point. And I see no one else on deck. So if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hands. Hi, thank you. Um, my question now is, uh, if you guys are going to make the building, how long would it take? Um, I'm now about concerned about the school with the noise and the dirt coming into since the kids have like to play outside and the playground is pretty much the, especially the preschool is the closest to um, to the new building that they're creating. So how long is, is this building going to start um, if it's approved and then how long is it going to take to be built? That's my question. Brody needs to be unmuted. No, already I can certainly do that. Sorry, my dog started barking, so I had to mute. Um, so, Lily, it takes us roughly a year to, from the time we put start moving dirt until we're open. Um, as far as dust and whatnot, we'll make sure we meet all the codes and um, to keep dust down. Um, so it is about a year process to, to get the, the building built and open. And I would like to add that the town does have dust control measures that uh, we'll be holding the project to, to make sure to your point that dust and um, noise and um, that kind of polluting effects doesn't uh, negatively impact the surrounding properties there. Does that help answer your questions? Uh, well, the, the noise I'm, I'm talking like, is there a way for them to be building like after school or how is that going to work? Because you have children um, trying to study and learn. Well, there's like a lot of noise of a building being created next door. So my concern is it's and especially taking a year. That seems like a long time for a school to be like under noise. It looks like David Laws has uh, something to say on that. Yeah, I was just going to mention, um, and we understand the concerns with noise, and I'm sure you know that'll be certainly communicated for any activity on this project, on this property moving forward, whether it's this one or something else. So I would just, um, you know, this school site was just exposed to all the work that was done uh, for the residential homes behind it, right? So all those homes were built over this past year, year and a half at this point. Um, and I don't know what the impacts to noise was the, for that project, but I would imagine for this one, it would be less than what you would, you know, have heard for, you know, all the hammering for the roofs and things that went on for construction of those homes behind the school. So, you know, certainly there could always be an impact, but I would say generally speaking, because of the separation between the, this site and the um, school, 
I wouldn't imagine the impact to be that great. Um, and in terms of hours, our hours are limited to daytime. Can you imagine uh, the complaints we'd get from homeowners who are trying to sleep if we were constructing, you know, after hours? That would probably be a bigger impact to the community. So, but I think you know, any any project going in on this prop property, uh, there would definitely be a heightened awareness and with respect to the impact to the kids next door. So. Alrighty, Lily, I'm going to go ahead and lower your hand so that we can get to some of the other uh, questions today, but feel free to raise it again if you've got more. Alrighty, at this time I'm going to unmute Levi and uh, on deck will be Karen. Uh, so for Karen and Brody, um, being a, an owner and developer myself across the country, uh, are you guys open knowing that your time is very uh, sensitive are you open to sharing your contact details for us to reach out to you directly? Yeah. Yes, actually, I had it on my last screen, so um, I can share that, Kyle, um, if you want me to. Yeah, by all means, feel free. Okay, let me pull, again, me and technology. I'll get there. <laughs> um, and it has, um, it has my contact and um, Robin Large, who's a land planner um, in my office. Um, and then I can, as, as you have questions, Levi, we can get Brody, Brody on the call. So um, yep. I'll share the screen and you can. Great. Thank you, Carrie. I've got that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I mean, just, and well, I'll get involved too as questions come up. Um, and happy to jump on a call or sit down with whoever. Great. Thank you. Levi, does that answer your questions? That was it. Thank you. Perfect. All righty. Then I'm going to ask Karen to unmute. Again, I don't see any other hands after hers. So if you have any remaining questions, please feel free to raise your hands. Hi, this is Karen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my husband and I live uh, at the very end of the street directly behind where this monstrosity is proposed to be built and we're beyond upset, as I'm sure you might imagine. Um, could you bring up the Miller Ranch 2018 map and you can see where we're at? Yeah. The site plan. <laughs> you think I get faster, but hang on. Yeah, I'm gonna be right there. Yes. Not the cul-de-sac, the very last one, that one. That one, yeah. Uh, this is just so distressing. We we researched Earl Valley before coming out here. Love the area, uh, the, the non-commercial aspect of it. And we, as Steve said, were not told anything about this when we bought the house. And now, come to find out, it's been in the works for years. Uh, I'm going to let my husband Tom make a comment. All right, well, a couple things. Um, you can see that where you've proposed that, that's directly in our backyard. So, putting trees up or anything, we're still going to see that in our backyard. We actually paid a premium from the developer, from the housing building, the building uh, company, to put that house there so that we can have a view. So, that, I don't know why we were. They could charge us a premium. I think Steve had the same problem and the neighbor to, on the cul-de-sac. We all paid big premiums to have a nice view back there. And now that's being taken away from us. Number two, there's three miles away. There's already another self-storage here. I think it's on the Marana side of town. And they've got a, uh, it's on Thorny Dale and Tangerine. And they've got a basement in theirs. We actually use that when we were moving out here to store stuff there. Couldn't this company here have a basement as well and then lower that another 10, 12 feet that way? That's my questions. So I can speak to the basement. As I mentioned, I'm not sure if you were on at the beginning, but we've got a vehicle pull through, which handles a lot of them. You know, any questions about security or noise, um, even if we were doing a, a basement, it would be the same thing as doing a two-story store and we still would have to have about 30 feet of the building would not lower uh, much than it is currently. 
Um, and then as far as the heights go, um, you know, we're staying under that 34 feet. I understand um, your concerns, um, but like I said, we're trying to stay within what the zoning code that was done years ago. Um, but we'll do what we can to mitigate. Uh, yeah, I mean, we are we are pretty impacted there where that ends up. Not much yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I and I think um, the um, Mr. Schmidt, I think, is directly to your to your nor uh, north as well. So I think as this proceeds, um, we're Brody and I, and we can coordinate through staff, or you can contact us directly. Are you know willing to come out and and talk through kind of the view sheds? And we did that when we did the the. Um, I was involved when we entitled all of. Um, actually your residential development and the folks over on the west side were very, very concerned with that development. Um, it, was, it was entitled, but we reduced the density significantly. Um, and then we worked with these homeowners on the, on the vegetation um, and the other, the other um, mitigation measures. So I, I think Brody can't really kick me under a table because he's really far away, but um, we've worked well together long enough that um, we're happy to, to talk with you guys directly and come out because keep in mind that what we're proposing is the use is what's subject to the conditional use permit, but the, what's, what's already entitled that doesn't require any public process out here is the tech park uses with buildings that are 34 feet in, in height. So, um, so that's the underlying entitlement. And so by asking for this, we, we have an opportunity to work with you to maybe do some additional mitigation. Yeah. So we're happy and to I, do that. Yeah, I'm happy to come out there and own site. Look, my mom, like I said, I live in Greenville, but there's a big mixed use development got done adjacent to my mother, very similar to your situation. I understand the emotional side of it. I'm happy to come out there and, and sit down with you at your house and look at the view corridor, see what we can do. Uh, to mitigate what we can. Um, I understand your concern and we'll do what we can with certain things that we've done throughout the country to try to mitigate as best we can. All right, yeah, I'd like to speak to you guys. We're out of state right now, but uh, I guess we can make plans when we get back. We'll be back uh, end of next week. I'm, I'm out of state too, so. Uh, I, can, I can help share that contact information for y'all. So, uh, Karen, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but if you guys would like to reach out to me at kpacker at orovalleyaz.gov, I can help get uh, get all those emails and contact information shared. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Absolutely. I'm gonna go ahead and mute you and lower your hand. And at this time, I do see Steve, but I want to go ahead and take a moment to uh, give folks an update. We're, as we approach the end of the neighborhood meeting at 7.30, I want to go ahead and let folks know that there will be a second neighborhood meeting. So what we're going to be doing is uh, after this meeting, as I said before, the applicant will give us a formal submittal that we'll review and post online for folks to review as well, at which point uh, when we've got one that can be that is zone, zoning code compliant, uh, we'll be bringing it back to the uh, a second neighborhood meeting, similar, almost identical to this one, where you'll be able to see the updated plans as well as uh, other documents that the applicant provides, at which point we'll be, uh, you know, they'll have the opportunity to take your feedback and comments into uh, addressing as far as their designs go, at which point uh, then we'll move those documents forward to the Planning and Zoning Commission as well as Town Council. So that said, I will ask Steve Schmidt to unmute. And if anyone else has a few comments, I think we've probably got time for two or three more. All righty, Steve, I have asked you to unmute, I believe um, not seeing anything. I'll go ahead and try one more time here. 
maybe a technical difficulty on my end. So if I can ask Malini to try to unmute uh, Steve here. Looks like I'm not getting Steve to be able to respond. So I'll go ahead and ask uh, Mr. R. Brian Davies to unmute and you'll be have the floor at this time. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. R. Brian Davies, I'm down at uh, the bottom of on Tangerine, the little white house at the bottom of Miller Ranch, just to the west of it. Um, since 2007, uh, when all this master plan changed from uh, low density residential, um, it slowly kind of creeped in more to change that whole area. And um, the main thing that uh, I'm, I'm arguing against here is that uh, I think that this is a really bad fit to put a large elephant sized box building in the middle of that area that's going to obstruct the views of all the residents on the west side there. They're all upset about it, um, and that's just the beginning of it. And really, besides what you're putting there, it, it started out with that um, the tech park, which we all agreed on at one point as a compromise to have a few buildings that were uh, single and double story, and the maximum size of any one building was about 8,000 square feet. They ranged from that to about um, 4,000 square feet, so it was more of an office type of an area on that tech park. And now you're putting this huge box there that's going to obstruct the views. Anything you put there has to be compatible with the surroundings. That's the initial criteria of that area. And it has to be not non-detrimental to the welfare of any of the people in that area. And what's, what's, with this huge elephant box, it's going to, be, um, it's going to ruin the view and um, lower the property values. Everybody's upset about it. And um, before it even gets on to this next thing, I think it's just a really bad fit. And that's my comment. And um, I'll sign off after that. All righty. Well, thank you very much for that comment. You're welcome. At this time, I'm going to ask Steve Schmidt to unmute again. And please double check to make sure that you're not muted on your side. Unmuted. OK. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. You know, I was I was a little bit confused with the discussion about cross traffic. Currently, you know, when we sit in our backyard, we see cars loading and unloading children that are coming from Tangerine and they're going on a dirt road. Number one, I, I can't believe they even can have access there. I would think that that would be private property. Number two, if there's any consideration as far as your traffic study to have cross traffic going across here, we certainly would be, we would object to it. So I just wanted to mention that because again, it was a little bit confusing to me as to where you were going with this discussion about cross traffic. Uh, that's it. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and let David Laws speak to that here as our permitting manager. Okay, um, so the main thing that we're looking for with this property, because we've got a school on it, and because the school generates a tremendous amount of traffic during uh, drop off and pickup, is we want to make sure that when we've got commercial traffic and that school traffic that we try to keep that separated as much as possible, um, you know, during those peak hours. But when it comes to, you know, access for a commercial center, if you look at the approved master development plan for this property from years ago, you know, that cross access exists, even though it's not there today, in the future, you know, there's plans to have that connection. And that helps distribute traffic from the center to the, you know, the streets that are adjacent to it. So as opposed to making everyone go in and out at one single entrance or exit, we, you know, we like to see that type of commercial center have multiple points of ingress and egress. For this property though, because of the school, we're gonna have to look at that very closely to make sure that you know whatever is proposed will work. Traffic leaving Lehman through the dirt road, you're right, that's private property. That's not designed for you know, those parents to use, but they do it anyway. 
um, this development as it goes in, we'll have to evaluate what improvements are going in with this particular phase. And we'll have to see if that can be controlled in a better way. But you know, it's very preliminary for me and anyone of us to say what the end result will be because we don't even have a formal submittal yet. Um, so hopefully that helps clarify that a little bit. Thank you, David. I'm going to go ahead and at this time, if you have any remaining questions, uh, please send them to kpacker at orovalleyaz.gov. I'll be taking those to the, uh, they'll be included in a neighborhood summary meeting, uh, neighborhood meeting summary that will go in my staff report to the Planning and Zoning Commission as well as Town Council. And additionally, if you would like to be added to the mailing list for this project and you haven't been, please reach out to me at that same email address, kpacker at orovalleyaz.gov. That'll be the best way to get connected to more information on this project and make sure that you're on the mailing list. So at this time, I'm going to share my screen here and just share some of the next steps for this project. So again, I'd like to thank you for joining tonight's neighborhood meeting. The next opportunity to provide comments and ask questions will be at the next neighborhood meeting after the applicant's formal submittal and staff review. And we'll be sending notice out in advance of this meeting. So as I said, if you weren't notified, please reach out to me at the email address on this slide here. Public input can also be provided at the Planning and Zoning Commission meetings, as well as town council meetings, and notice will be sent out in advance of all of those public meetings. At this time, they're most likely to be held at town hall. Uh, please help us spread the word about this proposal and the upcoming public participation opportunities. Signs have been posted on this property and adjacent property owners have been directly notified by mail. And that process will be similar for all of the upcoming meetings as well. So I'd like to, again, just urge folks to forward all of their questions and comments to me at kpacker at orvalleyaz.gov and go to ovprojects.com and visit the project name listed here to uh, stay up to date on all the new information as it becomes available. Thank you very much for your time tonight and have a wonderful evening.